If you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48. I do want to make a public service announcement real quick. We are aware that the projectors are sideways, sort of, not evenly square. We had to move them because this monstrosity of a VBS set behind us, it wouldn't shine over the top of them. So I was sitting there looking at it. I was like, I should have mentioned that earlier that we aren't a little off balance. We do know that they're out of whack, but they will be moved back uh, next week. Genesis chapter 48. We're going to spend our time this morning in Genesis 48 through 49, uh, verse 27. I want to ask a question. I wonder if you consider yourself non-conventional. Non-conventional. Now, let me provide a definition as you think about this question. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines non-conventional as not conforming to convention, custom, tradition, or usual practice. Put simply, non-conventional means not doing things the way that they've always been done or expected to be done. Now, there are many things about us as people that are non-conventional. For some of us, we are natural-born rebels. It's in our very DNA, especially us middle children, to kick against the grain, to do things differently because we have this rebellious streak within us. Maybe, Maybe we have too much rock and roll in us. That's what I like to think about myself. We thrive on non-convention. We thrive on pushing back against the man, pushing back against tradition or what is expected. So there are things we may do or engage in in our personal lives that are non-conventional. Maybe in our work lives, we do things that are non-conventional. But then on the other hand, you might have quite the opposite. Maybe there are some of us that are very conventional, very cookie cutter, if you will. We are people, maybe people by the book. We do them the way they're supposed to be done. We like it the way things have always been done. We like the customs of our day, and we find no reason to push back or change any of it. We're conventional people, and we're okay with that. Maybe that's some of us here. But what we've seen through the book of Genesis, and what we see today as this book comes to a close next week, is that God works in very non-conventional ways. This is really the story of the whole Bible. It's the story of Christianity. God does not always choose to work within man-made traditions or man-made customs in order to accomplish His purpose on earth. He very often works in ways that are not in accordance with custom in order to bring about His desires on earth through His people, non-conventional. We see another aspect of this today as Jacob blesses the sons of Joseph and then gives prophetic blessings and anti-blessings, if you will, to his sons before he dies. And within these two events that we see today, we clearly perceive that everything God does, he does with a purpose in mind, even if that purpose is not realized for thousands of years into the future. You see, within God's infinite wisdom, our great God is not constrained by time. And because He is not constrained by time, God can wait as long as God wants to, to bring His purposes to fruition. And so these prophetic blessings passed on from Israel to His sons came to fruition, some taking longer than others. But the promise made to Abraham stood firm, finding its longed-for fulfillment in Jesus, the line of the tribe of Judah. And so I pray this morning that as we look at His holy and inspired Word, God's holy and inspired Word, I pray that the Holy Spirit would work among us. Once more this week, because we're covering a larger portion of Scripture And there isn't one particular set of verses that I will read. We're not going to stand for the reading of the Word as I will read various portions throughout the rest of our time this morning. But with this in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord for blessing, for insight and transformation as His Word is proclaimed this morning. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we ask that as we approach Your Holy Word, God, that You would give us clarity insight, understanding into the truths that you have laid before us this morning as put forth and carried out in the lives of your people. God, we pray that you would open our eyes to see your truth. 
that by your Spirit you would plant it deep within us and that, God, we would glory and rejoice in your perfect plan in sending Jesus Christ to this earth to redeem your people. God, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we find ourselves in Genesis 48 this morning, there are three remaining chapters in the book of Genesis. We're going to cover chapter 48 in the first half of chapter 49. And Moses has been tracking this story of Joseph for many chapters now. We've seen this for, for several weeks Various aspects of the life of Joseph and how God was working through the in and through the life of Joseph. Joseph, and as I've mentioned before, Moses spent twice the amount of time considering the life of Joseph as he did Abraham. And this points to the importance of what he is wanting to communicate to Israel, the readers of this uh, document, as they wander through the wilderness, having been set free from slavery in Egypt. And once more, we see how an all-wise and an all-sovereign God works in history to bring about His purposes in redeeming a people for Himself. But as we come to the, con the conclusion, these last three chapters of Genesis, Moses isn't done yet. He still has something else he wants to communicate under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit before he wraps up this story of Joseph. And that is what we're going to see this week and next week as we conclude this book. And so as we begin walking through these chapters, instead of offering a, a summary first, just a, 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 an extensive summary of what's happening within these chapters, I'm going to begin uh, with my points of observation and mold together my observations and my summary uh, at the same time. And I want to make three observations from this text as we walk through what is happening in these different sections. So my first observation from this text is this. God's sovereignty over social conventions. God's sovereignty over social conventions. As already mentioned, God works in ways that are non-conventional. Non-conventional. And as many of us do things in non-conventional ways, God most certainly, as we have seen very clearly throughout Genesis and throughout the whole Bible, God most certainly does the same. You see, as 48 opens up, Jacob is nearing death. Jacob has one foot in the grave, if you will. And realizing this, he wants to make sure he ties up any loose ends here on earth before he goes, primarily in conferring prophetic blessing on his offspring and promising the fulfillment of the covenant made with his grandfather Abraham. And so Joseph is told that his father is ill. And so Joseph takes his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and into, into see his father, their grandfather. And we're told in chapter 2 of verse 48 that Jacob mustered up enough strength to sit up on the bedside and to talk with his son about matters that were too important to delay. You see, he didn't talk about the difficulties of his life in this moment as he's nearing the end of his life. He didn't talk about how tough he had had it in this life. He spent his time talking about God Almighty and what God had done for his servant, Jacob. You see, this is not unusual for us as we arrive at this point in Genesis. If you remember, we've seen instances similar to this <clears throat> Excuse me, since the start. If you remember, when Abraham was nearing death, his desire was to find a wife for Isaac so that he could transfer to him the covenantal blessing we saw in Genesis 24. Unfortunately, if you fast forward ahead, when Isaac thought he was about to die, Isaac wanted a bowl of soup before he conferred the blessing on his favorite son, who we then learned was not God's choice to receive the covenant blessing we see in Genesis 27. Now, Jacob's concern was to bless Joseph. Joseph was not the firstborn, but if you remember, God, uh, Jacob had made him the firstborn. And then Jacob adopts Joseph's two sons as his own to make them sons of Israel. And so in this moment, Jacob recounted some of the experiences with Yahweh, particularly the promise made to him at Bethel and the death of his favorite wife we see in verse 3 and then verse 7. He assured Joseph that one day God would multiply his offspring greatly and lead them out of Egypt into their inheritance into Canaan. And not only that, but Joseph's sons Manasseh and Ephraim would also share in that inheritance. As Joseph replaced Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and now Manasseh and Ephraim will replace Simeon and Levi, the second and third sons. 
Then, in a non-conventional way, Jacob blesses Manasseh and Ephraim. Let's read verses 13 through 16 of chapter 48. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near to him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life, long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys, and in them let my name be carried on, in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So not only did Jacob adopt his grandsons, but he bestowed a special blessing uh, done in a way that we're told in verse 17, displeased Joseph. You see, this appears to be a joyful moment, but then when Joseph saw that Jacob put his right hand on the wrong son, it displeased him so much that Joseph moved his hand. You see, that was the hand of blessing. And Jacob brought him forth, Joseph brought his sons forth so that the older would have, his, have Jacob's right hand on him. But Jacob mixed it up and put his right hand on the younger and his left hand on the older. And so Joseph is thinking in worldly ways in which the expectation is for blessing to go to the older son, which was custom. But if we remember together, all throughout the book of Genesis, this cultural expectation had been overturned. Remember Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob, even Reuben. Now the same is true of Joseph's sons. The God of the Bible, the one true God, is the one who does not operate in accordance with worldly conceptions of power and status. But he lifts up the downtrodden and uses the weak in the world as he works often in non-conventional ways. You see, many of us in this room are OCD, type A. It has to be done this way and only this way. Anyone want to admit to that? I'm close to that in a lot of ways. Adam, you with me? Thanks, buddy. Support. When we think about our home life, our work life, our personal life, or anything else in between, it's either black or white, it's right or wrong. It is this way, and only this way, and there's often no room for variation. You know that type of person? It might be you, and you just don't know it. But, this is not true of God. You see, he is often non-conventional in his dealings, just like we see here in this moment. God turns upside down the worldly conceptions of power and status. He often uses the weak in the world to oppose the powerful, which is non-conventional to this world. And too often as Christians, hear this, too often as Christians, we get frustrated with God because we, per we do not perceive that He's answering our prayers, working in the way we want Him to work, or is seemingly distant from us when we cry out to Him. But maybe, just maybe, the problem is not God, the problem is us and our expectations. You see, how do we expect God to work? What do we expect God to do? Do we expect Him to do things in the conventional ways of this world so that it benefits us or fits into our nice little box? Or are we open to God working in non-conventional ways that do not necessarily align with the way we think things ought to be done? You see, Joseph thought he knew the way things should have been done in this moment, but what we see is quite the opposite. You see, most of the time, God doesn't work in the way we think He should work. A lot of us know that from experience, the hard way. God doesn't always work the way we think He should work, and we need to be okay with this because His way, many times non-conventional, is better than your way and my way. You see, Jacob's doing something revelatory as he blesses Ephraim in this way. Joseph thinks his dad's just getting old and getting it wrong. His eyesight's not very well. And it's a parallel to Isaac and Esau, is it not? Something very similar. And so once more, things have been reversed, yet 
this time without deception. Jacob himself is reflecting on how the Lord has worked in his own family and reflecting on how the Lord has worked in history, thinking about the older serving the younger. Now he is seemingly willingly participating by faith in the God who chooses the lesser to rule over the greater. And so in this instance, Jacob knows God has made this promise to Abraham that is going to be carried out through his descendants, and now he is communicating this blessing to the sons of Joseph. And the pattern, patterns of God using the younger sons is shaping his actions and what has happened before. Jacob isn't wrestling with the Lord here, but thinking this is how it goes. And it's very similar to the anointing of King David we see later in history. And so church, be encouraged by the non-conventional working of God in the book of Genesis and in this instance. And remember, when you become frustrated in your flesh, flesh because God has not responded to your prayers the way you think He should, or He's not worked in a way that fits into your little box or my little box of how things are supposed to be, remember first that God does not owe us anything. He does not owe us a single thing, and He is not bound to the ways of this world. He is not bound to do things the way we think they should be done. But trust Him and be open to God working in whatever way He wants to work. He might be answering your prayer right now, but it's in a non-conventional way. And maybe, you're, maybe we're stuck, so stuck in social conventions of our time that we're missing it. I don't know. But I know we serve a God who uses the weak things in this world to shame the wise and accomplish His purposes. We need just be open to the Lord's workings. Second observation. A family with a future. Actions have consequences. A family with a future. So Jacob blesses Joseph's sons, adopts them, blesses them in this non-conventional way. Then he calls his other sons to him to receive a prophetic blessing. And once more, this is a striking contrast to Isaac's blessing given behind closed doors and to Jacob's deceptive scheme to gain that blessing in Genesis 27. You see, in these blessings, Jacob is reminding us of his son's behavior and the consequences of that behavior. And his words of revelation are a revelation of human character and conduct as well as of God's divine purposes in bringing them to fulfillment. In this instance, in this blessing, three sons learned that their past conduct had cost them their future inheritance. For we always reap what we sow. But something else was true. Jacob's prophetic words must have, been given, must have given great encouragement to his descendants during difficult times of suffering in Egypt as well as during their unhappy years wandering in the wilderness. You see, Jacob assured each tribe that he blessed of a future place in the promised land. And that meant a great deal to them. And so I want to quickly walk through these prophetic revelations this morning. Judah and Joseph get longer treatment in Genesis 49, and so I'm going to save them for last. But hang with me as I go through these names. So Jacob begins with the sons of Leah, the three oldest, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, as we've already mentioned briefly. And the blessings of these three men are actually anti-blessings. We've seen those before and mentioned those before. Much like Esau's anti-blessing in 27, 39 through 40. For Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, this doesn't go well for them. If you remember, Reuben initially as the firstborn, as Genesis 49, 3 tells us, inherited honor and power. But then Jacob took it away for his sexual offense against him by defiling Jacob's wife, he says in 49, 4. And so this sin he committed years before caught up with him and he lost all of the privilege of, his first, of the firstborn son. And it's difficult to find in Scripture any member of the tribe of Reuben who distinguished himself as a leader. The tribe declined in numbers between the exodus and the entrance into the promised land. We see in Numbers 1, 2, and 26, moving from 7th to ninth place. Dathan and Abiram were Reubenites who gave leadership in the rebellion of Korah in Numbers 16, 1, which led to the deaths of thousands of people. 
And whereas Reuben's costly sin was lust, Simeon and Levi were guilty of anger and violence in their massacre of the Shechemites in their attempt to avenge the defiling of their sister. And they equally share the traits of violence, anger, and cruelty, and they share the same condemnation and fate we see in 49 verse 7. And so God arranged that these two tribes would not be able to assemble or do anything together. And the tribe of Simeon was eventually absorbed into the tribe of Judah, we see in Joshua 19. And the tribe of Levi, although not given an inheritance in the promised land, was, was, 48 towns, was given 48 towns to live in, scattered throughout all the land. And yet, yet, years later, in God's grace, this is the tribe from which the Levitical priesthood emerged as we'll see in a moment. And so there's little, there's little said about Zebulun and Issachar, but their blessings were favorable. Zebulun settled by the sea, making the transport of goods profitable for its people. They were brave warriors with excellent reputations, First Chronicles 12.33 tells us. Issachar was situated at the eastern end of the fertile Jezreel Valley in Joshua 19.17-22, sandwiched between Zebulun and the Jordan River. And the imagery of the donkey insinuates that he wasn't afraid to carry burdens as the people of Issachar were hardworking and devoted to the soil. And as I mentioned, we'll come back to the tribe of Judah if you're following along there in 49. We'll come back. But Jacob moves on to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Dan means to judge or judgment. This is a play on his name as one of the most famous judges comes from Dan, Samson, in Judges 13 through 16. Gad can mean both good fortune, raid, or a troop. And throughout history, Gad endures various attacks by the Ammonites, Moabites, Arameans, and Assyrians. Its people are celebrated as fighting warriors. Asher means blessed or blessed or ha- blessedness or happy. His blessing is a reference to its fertile land on the western slopes of the Galilean highland as it yields a wealth of olive oil. Naphtali is described as a doe, a deer famous for its beauty and being swift in motion. Then Rachel's sons. Let me consider Benjamin and then Joseph. And then I'll return to Judah. We might expect Jacob to say more about Benjamin, his youngest son, since it was such a point of contention sending him to Egypt. But his words are few, somewhat puzzling even. There's an animal imagery used to describe Benjamin indicating him as predatory, a ravenous wolf who devours his prey, which indicates his tribe will have a high reputation for bravery and skill in war. And when you read of the tribe's history, you see this very thing in action in Judges 19 and 20. Saul, the first king of of, uh, of Israel, was from Benjamin. And during his career, he more than once tried to kill David, we see in 1 Samuel 19.10. And he ruthlessly murdered everyone in the priestly city of Nob in 22.6. Other Benjaminites known for their ferocity were Abner in 2 Samuel 2.23, Sheba in chapter 20, and Shimei in 16.5-14. And let us not forget Saul of Tarsus, later converted and named Paul. Saul was a Benjaminite. He was like a wild animal when he persecuted the church and tracked down Christians to imprison them. And while ravenous, this tribe was also described in Deuteronomy 33.12 by Moses as beloved of the Lord. And when the nation divided after Solomon's death, the tribe of Benjamin remained faithful to the Davidic line and stayed with Judah, and together they formed the southern kingdom of Judah. A lot of history here. Now let's consider the blessing of Joseph. Let's read 49, 22 through 26. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your Father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your Father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. As we know so well, And as has already been mentioned, the story of Joseph is quite substantial. 
And Joseph was the first favorite son of Jacob. And so Jacob uses the term bless at least six times in his speech to and about Joseph. He compared Joseph to a fruitful vine, drawing water from a spring. And this is similar to the streams of water presented in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 verses 1 through 3 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In Psalm 1, the streams are a metaphor for the Word. And here, it points to Joseph's godliness, Joseph's faith, in spite of how verse 23 describes the hardship that he dealt with at the hands of his brothers. God was the reason for Joseph's ability to flourish, for the fact that everything he touched was blessed. We've seen that very clearly. And we're meant to think of the Messiah from Judah in light of Joseph, in which, is, which is why the imagery of shepherding and stone are used in this setting. All of this from the mighty one of Jacob, the Lord. And then verse 25 attributes all of this to the Almighty who will bless Joseph with blessings from heaven. Again, we know this from our time in Genesis. Almighty is only used in certain places in Genesis. And Jacob is calling upon El Shaddai and the blessings from heaven above and deep beneath. Blessings of the breasts and of the womb which signify his wife will be fertile and fruitful and nourish his children. Further, the blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings bestowed on him by his father Isaac. Again, what we have here is like a precursor, a typological prefiguring of the blessing that will be enjoyed by the blessed man. Joseph is the second in command to the most powerful empire in the nation, Egypt, in the world, excuse me. And Jacob doesn't even mention Egypt, does he? But points him heavenward. It's not Egypt that is your inheritance, Joseph. It is what Yahweh has blessed you with, the covenant-keeping God. Before we move on to Judah, I want to ask the question, what does all of this mean for us? These blessings here. We understand that Moses is communicating to the Israelites as they wander through the wilderness that each of the tribes they are a part of have either received a blessing or an anti-blessing. And this will most certainly either discourage the first three or give great strength to the rest as they wander through the wilderness. Yet knowing that God has given this blessing to each of them through Jacob, that one day this wandering in the wilderness will end. What does this have to do with us here at First Baptist Olo? Up to this point, without considering Judah, what does this mean for us? Well, first, this shows us some important things about God. These prophetic statements exhibit God's sovereignty over the nations. You see, Jacob does not offer these blessings over each of his sons and the offspring of each in hopes that they will one day come to pass. This is not Jacob's wishful thinking. These are divine prophecies given to Jacob by the Spirit of God that indicate God's sovereign control over the future and all of history. These prophetic blessings are not hopeful shots in the dark. They point to the divine wisdom and sovereignty of our great God in bringing to pass whatever He desires to bring to pass, past, present, and future. And I say this all the time, but we need to let this sink in. And we need to believe it, church. God is sovereign over all nations and all people. I know it's easy for us to watch the news, to read of wars and rumors of wars, to disagree with this politician, that politician, to have our own thoughts and opinions over how a country should be run, or just lose hope altogether, throw our hands up and subconsciously think to ourselves that there is no way God could change any of this. And we need to remind ourselves in these moments that the one true God, the one true God that we worship and adore, is sovereign over every nation, tribe, and tongue. He is so sovereign over all nations that He can turn the hearts of kings, rulers, dictators, and presidents at any point He desires and in any direction He desires. He is so sovereign over every nation that He is the one who sovereignly puts rulers in their positions, Paul tells us in Romans 13. He is so sovereign that He's going to redeem a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue before Jesus comes back, something He is currently doing today as people are being saved all across this world. 
Our God is sovereign over every nation. And when we become discouraged by what we see on TV, if we do not remind ourselves of this, we will most certainly lose hope. He's in control. He always will be in control. And to think that he is not is blasphemy. Further, we need to know that this account, from this account, that our actions have consequences. Ask Reuben, Simeon, and Levi if actions have consequences. You see, when Reuben, Simeon, and Levi committed their sins and injustices, I wonder if they think that dear old dad will forget about that one day in his old age. Sure, they were passed up by their other brothers when it happened in the moment, but surely there was a part of them that thought to themselves, when dad gets old, when he starts handing out an inheritance and blessings, surely he'll forget about the son sleeping with his wife and the other two that murdered a whole city. Surely. Surely. But that didn't happen. All of these years later, Jacob still remembered it, and their consequences had actions. Jacob blesses the tribes, but not independently from their character. Church, we know this very well, and we need to be reminded of this. Our decisions have consequences, just straight up. They have consequences. It may be years in the making, but past sins will most certainly find us out. And when God calls His people to be holy because He is holy, He means it. When Jesus tells us that true Christians are those who do the will of the Father, guess what? He means it. They have consequences in this life and potentially have eternal consequences. We know of Scripture's account for many who said they knew the Lord, but because they lived lives of habitual sin, all the, way saying, all the, all the while saying they knew the Lord, they received the ultimate consequence for their actions, namely eternal punishment. What we do in public and in private has consequences. But do not miss this. While our decisions have consequences, some of which are definitely more tough than others, there is so much grace found in this passage, in the blessing of these tribes. Again, before we get to Judah, remember that those brothers, these brothers who were just blessed by Jacob, participated in selling their brother into slavery. They sold Joseph into slavery. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi get cut for things they've done, but they weren't the only ones that were selling their brother into slavery. Yet Jacob extended grace to them and not holding them accountable for, what, for that action when he was giving out his blessings. He forgave them. He showed great grace in forgiving them of this sin as God had sovereignly worked, worked it all for Israel's good. And this is part of it, these blessings. But beyond that, and I mentioned earlier that the Levitical priesthood came from the tribe of Levi. Although Levi received this judgment, he received an anti-blessing. He got cut out, replaced by one of Joseph's own sons. While Jacob put forth this anti-blessing to Levi, not giving him part of the inheritance, God will redeem that atrocity for good. In Exodus 32, 25-29, the Levites rally around Moses and kill their idolatrous, fornicating brothers. In Numbers 25, 7-14, Phinehas, a Levite, kills a fornicating Simeonite. And for these acts, the tribe of Levi is set apart to the Lord and given the coveted priesthood. The Levitical priesthood, the Levites serve as fierce gods around the sanctuary and execute anyone who would encroach upon God's holy temple. Sinners had to reckon with this tribe, the tribe of Levi. And even in this judgment for their sin, God extends grace and redeems it. Even when the consequences and our actions bring hardship and judgment, we still have a God who will receive us and extend grace toward us. Isn't that good? That is so good. We have a God who can use what man meant for evil, what we meant for evil, and turn it for our good. Finally, let's consider Judah. Third observation, Christ, the line of the tribe of Judah. Let's look at 49, 8 through 12. Judah, your brothers, shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub from the prey. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. 
binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. The ESV Study Bible states this about these verses. In these words, Jacob predicts the great empire of David and the greater kingdom of Christ, the second David. This sets the tone for the chief aspect of messianic expectation in the Old Testament. The way that Abraham's blessing will come to the Gentiles will be by their ultimate heir of David reigning and incorporating the Gentiles into his benevolent empire. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Moses uses familiar language to Genesis 37 that was received by Joseph in dreams. Then we see the brothers come three times in fulfillment of these dreams, bowing down before Joseph. Now this coming king is coming from Judah, whose eleven brothers will bow down before him. Your neck will be on the neck of your enemies. This imagery points us back to Genesis 3.15 and the messianic expectation already established. David's interpretation is found in Psalm 1840. He says, you made my enemies turn their backs to me. But if you look in your Bible, you may notice a footnote on this verse that has another rendering that reads, you gave me my enemies' necks. David alluding to this idea that he is the king from the tribe of Judah, which we know will come through him and from him as the second and greater David. But what does this king from Judah look like? This king will look something similar to Joseph. Moses is showing us that we need to read the story of Joseph typologically. That is part of a pattern expecting fulfillment in the future. The promise that Joseph's brothers will bow down is already completed, but the pattern will happen again through the son of Judah. Verse 9, the lion is the animal that comes to be associated with Judah. This is the first time we see this lion of the tribe of Judah terminology. In verse 10, the scepter will not depart from him. This is a symbol of eminence and kingship. The fact that it will not depart from the tribe of Judah is confirmed by the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7.16. says this, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is also a widening of obedience. The blessings of Abraham will go to the nations as they will come to this king. Verses 11 and 12 point to the Messianic king using a choice vine to bind up his donkey, pointing to his great prosperity wherever he goes. We're going to tie our donkeys up with the choice vines. The vine is a symbol of fertility, of joy, of peace, and prosperity. And here it is a hyperbole of tremendous prosperity. No one but an incredibly wealthy person would tie up a donkey with a choice vine as the donkey would eat the valuable grapes. Go to a vineyard in California that produces choice wine. Take your donkey and go, hey, I'm just going to tie him up for a minute. It's not going to happen. He will be so majestic, prosperous, and mighty that not only will he tie up his donkey with a choice vine, he's going to do his laundry in choice wine. That's what it says. Will wash his clothes in choice wine. Potentially even make wine flow like water. John 2. The summary of these promises about Judah is Jesus coming from Judah's line. Jacob's blessing in granting the tribe of Judah eternal kingship over the nations pertains to David and the Davidic covenant. In the Old Testament, the prophetic blessing on Judah is fulfilled in David and his house, and in the New Testament, it is interpreted as being fulfilled and consummated in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Christ being the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, may have signified His fulfillment by changing water into wine as His first miracle. Then in Revelation, John sees the prophecy consummated in Revelation 5.5 when the line of the tribe of Judah executes judgment on the nations. And whether Moses realizes it or not, and whether Israel fully understands this or not, this blessing from Jacob on Judah points directly to Jesus Christ who crushed the head of the serpent on the cross, fulfilling Genesis 3.15. This points us to the great Savior and Lord Jesus Christ who took our sins on Himself on the cross, absorbing God's wrath within Himself in our place so that we did not have to, was buried in a tomb, rose three days later, victorious, seated high upon a throne, calling all of us to repent and believe in Him to receive salvation. 
And when the line of the tribe of Judah returns with King of kings and Lord of lords written on his thigh, we will see our great Savior Jesus, the one of whom Jacob prophesies about, and we will reign with him forever in the new heaven and new earth. That is beautiful, church. You ready? God in his infinite wisdom and in accordance with his predestined plan was pointing to Jesus in this blessing from Jacob. And hear this. Hear this. We take this for granted. Hear this. What a privilege and a joy it is that this great sovereign and all-wise God would share this revelation with us from His Holy Word. There are people across this world who have not received the Holy Word of God to receive this beautiful divine revelation. What a privilege it is for us, church, to have this, that God has gifted us with this. And what a joy it is for us to gather around one day a week, even, and hear the excellencies of our great God and what He's done in history to redeem a people like you and I who do not deserve His redemption and do not even deserve to hold this book in our hands, let alone read it. What a joy and a privilege it is for us to have this. And in His non-conventional way, God fulfilled this prophecy through the lineage of David by sending His Son to be born of a no-name woman in a no-name place. To live a normal life whose occupation was carpentry. To then be offered up as the Savior of the world. In church, may we glory in the everlasting majesty of our great God and praise Him that through the line of the tribe of Judah we can stand before His throne welcomed and forgiven as we know Him and He knows us. Pray with me.